Hey people, I'm Jay, I'm your salty old tour guide for Art 141. The narration in this course is mine. It's distilled from hundreds of lectures given over the last oh, 30 years or better. Well, for better or for worse. Anyway, it represents my personal view of art history with no attempt to make the subject into an objective science, mainly because it isn't and it never can be. Too many art historians use the conceit of scholarship and objectivity to suck the life out of every image and every idea like a spider clutching a, the husk of a fly. If I ever do that, hit me with something. This is not to say that art history is fact-free. It isn't. And where facts are involved, I'll do my best to get them right. But to my way of thinking, uh, the, the, the arena of subjective and you know, critical seeing ought to be at least 90% of this study, if not more. And the ultimate objective is to inculcate within you, the student, my love for the subject. I'll certainly convey to you my own ideas, as flawed, as prejudiced, or as compelling as those may be, but you folks are free to accept or reject them, so long as the facts around the core curric curriculum and the images are addressed. A lot of people think that art is only uh, an ornament or a condiment to life, like uh, mustard on a torpedo sandwich. In fact, art defines humanity, and it gives life whatever meaning it may claim to have. There's a big difference between the images we're going to review in this class and anniversary cards. For lack of a better word, near every image we talk about in Art 141 has an indefinable thing that I call content. Most people don't usually think of images as having content because most don't. Most of what we see every day is bathroom decoration or commercial kitsch. It's ephemeral and it's meaningless. In this class, every image means something. This is the second half of the Western Art History Survey course, a subject so big it demands two semesters just to play the big hits. In the first half, we talk about how it all got started, Egypt, ancient Greece, uh, the Romans, and art's long, slow recovery out of the Middle Ages. This course picks up after that, and uh, pick up it does. For every other place in the world, art is a matter of culture and tradition. And then the Italian Renaissance guys busted out of the Middle Ages and they tore the door off of its hinges. After that, Western art got diverse. It got revolutionary. It got contentious. It got restless. And it got sexy. For artists in Europe and then in America, every generation had its own idea. Every generation was sick of granddad. Every generation wanted to redefine the world. Every generation wanted its hero on the pop chart. Here's our whistle-stop tour for the next 18 weeks. Week zero, who are you? Tell us who you are and where you stand. Week one, the proto-Renaissance in Italy. It's 1300, it's hip, it's now, and it is happening in Italy. Week two, late Gothic in the north. Well, it was happening in Italy until the Black Death took him out of the game for 50 seasons. The heavy hitters go north. Week three, early Renaissance art in Italy. The Italian team is back and with a new all-star lineup. Week four, high Renaissance in Italy. The Renaissance comes on like a freight train. Week five, 16th century art in the north. The Germans wake up and smell the coffee. Week six, high and low Baroque. Caravaggio and his posse kick ass and take names. Week seven, the golden age of Dutch painting. Protestants come out of nowhere and crash the league. Week eight, 18th century art in Europe and America. The muscular new republics seize momentum. Week nine, Classicism versus Romanticism versus Realism. The old school and the new school face off and trade punches. Week 10, the Amer American emergence post-Civil War. The Yankees weigh in. Week 11, post-Impressionism and the birth of modern art. The old guard folds. Week 12, the modernist revolution in the 20th century. Young bloods of the new school 
crash the gates of Western art with a radical new art for the new century. Week 13, American regionalism and the huge Mexicans. Americans long for the good old days while the Mexicans redefine public art by sledgehammer blows. Week 14, abstract expressionism and late modern art. Overnight, America becomes the modern art capital of the Western world. Week 15, postmodern art. The art world fractures and modern art retreats. Week 16, 20th century graphic art. The newsstand is the poor boy's art museum. Week 17, you are the museum director. You know everything I know, and now it's up to you. For the next 18 weeks, your job will be simple, if not easy. First, you'll need to remember and comprehend some information. Review the images in each weekly chapter unit. Check out the recorded lecture. Next, you want to review and answer the study questions for each chapter. Take a short weekly quiz when you're ready. Lastly, you'll need to analyze a question, a video, or a reading assignment on the discussion board with the other students. The last week, you will turn in the creative assignments, a compare and contrast term paper, and a curated online exhibition. Uh, parameters will be announced. So, how do I teach? Well, whenever possible, I like to be Socratic. What is that? Well, I'll explain with a story. I tell lots of stories in this course. I like stories, and Western culture has many good ones. There's an old legend about Socrates. Socrates went to the oracle, and he asked, Who is the wisest man in Athens? The oracle replied, It is you, O Socrates. Well, Socrates never just accepted the word of any authority, no matter how lofty. And so he decided, he decided to do a little fact-checking. It's always a good idea. He sought out the leaders and the teachers and the professionals of Athens, and he questioned all of them. He discovered that the teacher knew everything about his topic, but nothing about education. The lawyer knew everything about law, but nothing about justice. The politician knew everything about getting votes, but he didn't know anything about governing. The philosopher knew everything about theories and dialectics, but he could not prove that one was any better than another. The high priest knew everything about the gods, but could not prove that any one of them was real. Now, Socrates would never just declare an idea to be false. He would never just say, well, that's just bullcrap. He was far more irritating than that. He loved to talk, and he would question an idea until the idea just fell apart. Socrates was always standing conventional wisdom on its head. That's how he got killed, but that's another story. Socrates declared that the oracle was correct. He was indeed the wisest man in Athens because he alone knew that he knew nothing. And so I come to you, not with all the answers, but with many questions and discussions in search of an elusive truth about a deep and compelling subject, the richest, the most varied, the most content-laden visual record in the story of humanity. Welcome to Art History 141.